and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is true, you you are we are allowed to have this general aqidah. And on top of that, we do have a dua. Oh Allah, show me the truth as truth and guide me to it, mm-hmm. and show me falsehood as falsehood and let me avoid it. Right? That dua <coughs> may be the answer that will guide you towards true and false. Um, just to add on, mm-hmm. um, let's say certain like let's say certain schools have actions. Um, like for example, group thinker, and uh, it seems very enticing, and like you know what? Oh, they it say. is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> That's it was you, Khaled kind of Latif, was saying some people are uncomfortable. No, it was no, you. No, no. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Okay, okay good. But, uh, some other people wouldn't enjoy it too much. Yeah. But, uh, then they're telling me, oh, this is bid'ah, and I'm like, you know, this one group. That's their attempt at gaining the truth, but then they're saying they're deviant, and these are like scary things because I feel like I'm walking on thin ice. Yeah. And if I fall either way, I will tell you that the answer to this is that group thicker is an action. Actions can be debated. Innovation in action, basically, they're telling you it's sinful. They're not outside of Ahlus Sunnah by an action like that. And I'll be the first to tell you it is acceptable debate. It is acceptable for someone to say. No, it's not the path of the Prophet and it's an innovation. You are upon a sound of position. All right? And the opposite side has its evidences. Sayyidina Umar did it in the mas- uh, at, at, at Mina. And the Prophet Sallallahu did this in Sahih Bukhari. All right? It's in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet and the Sahaba were doing loud dhikr after every salah. It's in Sahih al Bukhari. Okay? And therefore, the only de- matter that's actually debated was were their voices all in one at the same time? So that's the issue of the debate. Okay, that's a very minor issue. Okay, so you guys do loud dhikr and everyone be off. Let's see what's going to happen. Within two minutes, you'll all be on the same. It's nature, right? If everyone's talking, reciting Fatiha, cacophonously, right? Within 10 re- repetitions, we'll all be at the same, right? So it, either way, we accept that to difference of opinion. I had a podcast with Hatim al Hajj on that, Sheikh Hatim al Hajj, and, that and he confirmed that too. So that's, that should not be... Uh, but what is actually wrong is to say that you're outside of Ahl sunnah on a matter of discussion. On an equivocal matter that could be go either way. And you're saying you're outside of Ahl sunnah and a mushrik and a muqtada and kulli bid'at in dalala. Yes, kulli bid'at of aqeed. Alright, is dalala. Not interpretation. So. Yes, young man? So that... The balance is priorities. Did not the Prophet وسلم, said, Oh Ali, you're going to negotiate with the enemy right now. What does that mean? That means for Allah Ta'ala, He's going to negotiate with the enemy. For Allah to guide one person through you is better than all the spoils of war of conquering them. Okay? So our first priority is da'wah. When we practice, we need to prioritize the ones who are onlookers outside of Islam. The greatest thing that you could the greatest achievement is that a person is not on La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then because of your behavior, they say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So this to us, in our minhaj, in our approach, this is the highest priority. All of our ibadah is based upon what? That we're Muslims. Right? And Allah says, أَفَتَطْمَعُونَ أَن يُؤْمِنُوا لَكُمْ Don't you have greed that they believe what they, we believe? We should be, have, be covetous that people outside of Islam find and see beauty in it that is worth, worth, makes it worthy of investigation. And that they end up concluding that Allah is true and the Prophet is true. We try to do this without cutting any corners. And without cutting corners, if it means that I will have a reduction in something like clothes or 
I don't know what that is up for discussion, then it's worth it, right? If you have non-Muslim parents, you would know this. You pick battles. Some people are your enemies. You have to draw a line. There's no doubt about that. But some people are not your enemies. They just, they don't believe in what you believe. So it's really upon you to make this as palatable as possible. That is far greater of a reward than maybe doing everything that in our conception is good, is sunnah, and then they're, it take, you, you push them away. So the way in which you do it is in a way where you're not compromising anything of obligations and prohibitions. And even sunnah, sunnah mu'akkad. But the way in which you do it should be palatable to them. This is the best thing that you could do to somebody. Is, and even sometimes within a family, you have ghafirin, you have heedless people in your family. You want to drive them away or bring them closer. So you have to negotiate this in your behavior. Yes? So in At-Timidi, um, it was narrated that like the Hadith about the camel when Rasulullah um, came across a Bedouin and asked why he didn't tie it down. And he said, I have my trust, my yakin in Allah. And then he said, um, tie down the camel and then have yakin in Allah. That's exactly what the meaning of there's no reliance upon Allah unless you have a plan first. So you have to take action. Yeah. When should we know like when to... Uh, tie down our camel. Uh, every time we do something, we have to exhaust all possible means. Then you can rely upon Allah. As long as there's stones left unturned, you don't have the right to rely on Allah. You have to not leave any stone unturned. So much so they said when the Prophet ﷺ planned, he planned as if he never relied upon Allah. After he was done planning, he relied upon Allah so much it's as if he never planned. today is knowledge all right no one is attacking no one in the west is attacking your body that's not that's not like Gaza or the Rohingyans or the Uyghurs where their bodies are being attacked Afghanistan at least their bodies are being attacked they're physically being attacked outside in the Western Hemisphere it's your mind is being attacked your hearts being attacked with culture like music is an attack on your heart ideas are an attack on your brain you need to uh, be armed so every one of us if you learn one thing you need to pass it on this is how we were taught that there is no more time to study for four years then help people no there's no time for this you learn one thing about aqidah about epistemology cosmology logic methodology you need to pass it on as much as you can you need to spend no there's no rest there is no rest there's no time the only time you have to rest is another obligation forcing you, right? Another obligation forcing you, holding you down. Otherwise, this is, uh, the wheels are off. The war has, is in full fledge. It's just happening in slow motion. That's why it doesn't feel like it's a war. It's a war on your hearts and minds. There's no doubt about it. Billions of dollars are spent by atheists to try to remove tax exemption from churches and mosques, to make sure that certain things are taught in public schools, okay? This is a war. It just hasn't reached the level of bodies. And they may not have to. Because if you win it, the soft war of minds and hearts, it saves you the trouble of having to do it through bodies. That's the only reason they're not doing it. The only reason they don't fight your bodies is because they're still, they still believe they can win it. They could just convert your minds. Right? We have to be stubborn. We have to seek knowledge. And we have to pass it on. And we literally have to become stubborn. Like people who are just immovable. Right? That's the nature of a Muslim today. The nature of a Muslim today has to have sandpaper in it. 
because the whole world's going one trajectory. We're going against the grain. What happens when you go against the grain? You get sparks. And that, that object becomes rough. Like you ever had a car that the, 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 the uh, tire falls off and you stop? That wheel is going to become all roughed up. We all have to be like this, right? You cannot be a softie in this day. You can be a soft in your personality, but not in your convictions. There's a big difference in Islam. Who is the strong and the weak? The strong is the one who trusts in Allah and will never disobey Him. The weak, the strong is not the one who's loud and rough. The, the weak is the one who is willing to compromise because he cannot face the reality of going against the grain. Did not the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is religion began a strange thing and will end again a strange thing. So blessed are the ones who are strange in their times. Meaning, they're going against the grain. So people have to study. They got to learn. If you have halakas on this subject, on aqidah, on fiqh, that's what you need constantly, non-stop. And reinforce the personality of a Muslim today. It has to be, there has to be sandpaper in your personality. You're going to get mocked, made fun of. Not only that, left behind. The whole world's going one way. Eight and a half billion people. And there's only a couple hundred million Muslims who are saying no. It's not even the whole Ummah of Islam. Most of the Ummah is going with them. Yeah. Uh, Salaam wa rahmatullah. I have a question about, like, basically with a lot of Muslims, like, we are culturally and, like, like, for example, culture mixes a lot with religion. So, like, in a nicer way, how do you, like, talk to people to, like, let them know, like, this is a cultural aspect and this is not a religious aspect and what they're doing is necessarily wrong without sounding mean? Because I feel like I always come across where it's, like, I get called like a kafir and stuff like that, but just wow. like saying that like, you know, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Can you give an example? Uh, so for example, there's a, a large population from where I'm from where they believe this one guy is like, like they basically like love him more than Allah. And it's like very scary where you see people talk about him a lot and it's like, you know, and they talk about him more than the prophet. And when you mention it, they are like, oh no, like you must not want to go to heaven and stuff like that. So it's like, how do you combat that with the, like also knowing that you want these people, you want to be really honest with these people in heaven, but it's like they're not mm -hmm. getting it, you know? So there, are, if people are upon excess, and uh, we call that ghulu, like they're excess, they're extreme in a matter, and you're trying to bring them to another matter or to a balance, and the best way is not by speech, not by words, but if you can take the individuals, uh, those individuals and somehow show them the rest of the ummah like eventually you gotta the more you mix with muslims different muslims the more you realize what is the truth what is opinion what is excess so i think that the best thing for pe groups that are extreme is to mingle with the ummah go to different masajid if you have the power to do that and the ability then that is worth more than words Right. The words may just, it's like blowing on a, a coal, it's just going to make it more inflamed. But to mingle around the ummah, that's why traveling, like we're traveling here to meet a new community, right? You go to different uh, countries, Hajj and Umrah, you see the whole ummah, the flatline measures of what Islam actually is, and what is just like our group's opinion. So, yes? What are your thoughts on people who say, you know, we need to do history to a Muslim country? It's their choice, really. I don't, um, it's not, if someone said, listen, I'm moving to California for a job, no one says anything, right? <laughs> if I want to move to Turkey to, because this isn't natural what we're living in. Every single day, facing some opposition, right? Even your peripheral vision is enough to psychologically burden you down. Like, my peripheral vision is everything that is not Islam, right? It's like contrary, constantly, everything. The way people dress, the way they act, the way they talk. It's always contrary. That's not a natural way to live. That's why Allah said there's a special place in paradise for these people. It's called Tuba. Tuba al Ghuraba does not just mean blessed are the stranger. It means there is a place in Jannah. No one goes there except minority Muslims. Right? Minorities in every face. There were some believers in Sayyidina Ibrahim, they were a minority among pagans. In the time of Prophet Isa, some of his believers ended up minorities amongst pagans. Some of the Bani Israel were minorities amongst pagans. And some of the Muslims are now minorities amongst pagans. Right? 
or amongst non-believers. So Tuba is a special place. This is not a natural mental state that we're in. This is abnormal. But as a result of that, if we stick through this and die upon this, we also get a reward that is not normal. That Muslims from the old times, our great grandparents perhaps, right? They will not enter this place, right? They will hear about it, but they will not enter it because they never had to go through what we went through, right? So I could fully understand if someone wants to make the hijrah. I would not accept if someone says, it's binding and your life here is haram. That's not acceptable, right? We could say the principle is that you're not allowed to live amongst non Muslims. That's a principle. There's always exceptions. And there could be a million exceptions, right? Like, there could be one exceptional rule, but it applies to millions of people. Inshallah, that applies to us. Yeah. Some of the Hanafi scholars told us that mechanical slaughter of meat is haram. They cite, like, various um, things like. Yes, that is the Hanafi ruling. So, yeah. is that, like, what should we follow? If that's your method, that's your method. It's not the Madiki ruling or the Shafi ruling. Uh, the Madiki and Shafi do hold that you can use. Um, that the, the, the slaughter does not have to be connected to the animal or to the blade. Just the Hanafis hold that. So the, the, the Sharia, um, the, the, what is it called? The Sharia Council of New York? What is it called? The Sharia, <coughs> Sharia Board of uh, New York. I, in, I talked to their, their main uh, person. He said that because we have so many Hanafis, we decided that the condition of halal is going to be by the Hanafi condition, which is the highest standard. In other words, it has the highest, most amount of rules to be observed. That's the valid opinion. The, the Maliki opinion is very different from that. The Shafi and the Hanbali is also very different from that. And the Maliki is like the lowest. We want to make a New Jersey Sharia board and apply the Maliki opinion. <laughs> <laughs> we do allow for the, 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 uh, the machines to slaughter, provided that it does the slaughter. That's the issue, provided that it slaughters. We would require a human to confirm that the animal didn't wiggle away or it didn't like slice the forehead and then the animal died of bleeding and fell into the vat of chickens. The whole vat becomes invalid because it's mixed now, unless you pull it out. If it's unknown, some of this, some of these hamburgers are halal, some of them are not. Which ones are which? We don't know. The whole thing has to be thrown out, right? Or given to, to animals to eat, not even humans, animals, right, to eat. So that's the rules of meat. So the, this is why I said, we don't go to the rulings itself. You're going to be dizzy. Go to the methodology, choose that methodology, live by it, right? That's it. In my family, we live by this book. Boom, this is the methodology. That's the law book of the family. Oh, but the Hanafis say this. Go be Hanafi then. <laughs> go live somewhere else then, right? If I, if I can't come to the judge in New Jersey, and say, hey, the speed limit in Germany is, is there's is no speed limit. He said, go, it's not Germany, right? This house has a law. It cannot have two laws. So we all have law and order. We have order in mind. I don't like, okay, but it's better than chaos. Legalistic chaos, right? When the ruling becomes impossible to, to, to practice, we do then dip into another madhab. And we do dip in the Hanafi madhabs the Hanafi Madhab on certain matters related to Najasa, right? Such as vanilla extract and other things like that. Our scholars have dipped in the Hanafi Madhab for that reason. Because you can't go and not eat everything with vanilla extract. It's too much. That's Our religion is not like this. Micro entering into chemical equations. That's not Islam, right? A Bedouin comes from the desert. He sees a cracker. Right? That's it. It's a crack. Okay? He's not going to go into the chemical compound. That's not Islam. That is Judaism. That's <laughs> <laughs> not the spirit of Islam. Right? Uh, one of my shiu, uh, what, he's, he went to Mauritania, and he told the sheikh, this bottle of oud, spray oud, has alcohol in it. Right? So the sheikh said, oh, stay here one second. He bought the people. Okay? And he said, what is this? They said, cologne. He said, thank you. <laughs> no alcohol. So, so the, the baseline that we look at is there's also a spirit in Islam, right? Uh, some of these apps, uh, don't go by them. They will go into the bare... This is not the spirit of Islam. Like, yeah. Just as a follow-up, they, they say that most of these chickens are put in like a water bath that like electrocutes them and that 
Monk, did they die before getting flooded? Is that like actually common or? It is true that they have to stun them a little bit so that they all fall off, fall down. Then they uh, take them and put them on the rack. Even the hand slaughtered factories do the same thing. If it dies, it's meta. Can't eat. Cannot eat something dead by electrocution. So it has to be a voltage that's very low. Right? It's funny, one fatwa he said, it relaxes them. Right? <laughs> so that's when, you, when you're done giving fatwas for the day, and you go home, right? Do you shock yourself to relax? Right? <laughs> so it's a practice that is makru. No doubt about it, it's makru. Because it's causing pain to an animal. Haram even, you could say, but they say it's darura, it's necessary. Otherwise, you have a guy chasing chickens all day <laughs> and putting them on the racks, right? So we're also a religion. We're not going to not eat chicken. That's also against this. That's not the spirit of Islam, right? So it is a makru. It is a maybe even sinful to do. They have to keep the voltage down. It's a very good fard kifaya, communal obligation for a representative to be in constant contact with the factories just to see what's happening. And we believe what they say. Right, and you can go if you want to say I want to go investigate myself. You know, a group of us should do that. That's what Halal uh, uh, New York Shura Board does. They go every once in a while, every six months, they check on the factories, an impromptu visit, and they give the stamp, and they check on the restaurants. Right, so uh, it should be done in a spirit uh, of you know just clarity, being transparent with the community. In the back there, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's referred to the Quran or a Hadith, but it mentions that when someone hears their death, they love to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet them, mm-hmm. or they hate to meet Allah, and Allah hates to meet them. Could you explain what that means? Okay, it's a beautiful uh, concept here. To love to meet Allah means I'm looking forward to death. In other words, to meeting Allah. Not that we love death. Say Aisha said, Oh, Master of Allah, we hate death. So it's not about hating death, it's that you love to meet Allah. Then there are two categories of people who hate death. One is rewarded and one is a sign of punishment. The one who hates death is the one who fears his sins. This is a hatred of death, meaning I feel like I'm not ready. I feel like I wish I had more time to make tawbah. Imam al-Ghazali says they are rewarded. That is the hatred of death that is acceptable. I hate to die because I have so many sins and I don't want to face all these sins. Then there is the one who has developed a love of dunya and he hates death because he doesn't want to leave this dunya. That's a portent or a sign of failure. Right? That's the hatred of death that's unacceptable. You mentioned earlier how um, we don't want to play on their playing field, right? But how do you deal with that when you're giving dawah and you're trying to, you're, you're on the offense now? The logic is the equal language. This is why if we don't, if we screw around with language and logic, we can't talk to anybody. Logic is not changed. There was someone who told me, the logic of your culture is not the logic of my culture. So I said, no, two plus two for me and you is the same, right? Every equation, whoever puts it up, a Hindu, Muslim, Munafiq, doesn't make a difference. Mathematical equations are the same. So logic is the language between us. Not only logic, we're humans, right? Human experience is the same too. A lot of human experiences are the same. Right? So uh, anecdotal evidence is powerful. Uh, Spiritual evidence is powerful too. It's not rational, it's not logical, but it is more powerful. Logic is like a fixed thing. It's like a chess when you're checkmated. But most people do not actually come to change their views because you checkmated them. They change their views because you showed them anecdotally that this is a better way of living. That's the reality of it. That's why we have jama'ah. Our families and our jama'ah, like, you want to be part of this. You would really want to be part of this. And also the, the, the appearance, the clean appearance, not covered in piercings, tattoos, no offense if someone has relatives like this or was in the past like this, but we do have a fitra. There is a limit where these things start becoming like demonic. They unsettle your heart after a while. You cannot alter the human being so much. If you see plastic surgeries on people, they tend to start looking the same, right? Like, like 
again, not to offend people who have taken Botox or used it, although we have rulings on it, but Botox, it really alters people. They all end up looking with the same look. And it becomes a disease because you cannot tell me that this is attractive anymore, right? Botox is not an attractive thing. The lips all look the same. Forehead looks the same. Cheeks look the same. Everything looks the same. And it's not an attractive look, right? So, fitra. When I believe personally the best dawah is strong communities. When people come in and say, your community, generally speaking, is no alcoholism. Pretty much generally speaking, the kids respect their parents. Pretty much generally speaking, the kids know who their parents are, right? That's huge. The kids are mentally and emotionally stabilized because they're always with their family, they're always with their parents, they're always with the elders, other elders of the community, so they're socially with it. They're grounded. And I know, like, we have a Catholic neighbor. She's like, man, you always have people over. And then we have these food trains. Every time someone gets sick in the community, the next week, people, different people schedule to bring them food. This happens for everyone in the community, right? When they see this, they're like, what is going on, right? What's happening here? Now they're used to it. But in the, we have never seen them having more than two cars in the driveway. Like, they, no one visits them. And they're like, amazed by the life. That's our best doubt. It's better than arguments, better than logic, better than anything else, is the anecdotal evidence that this life, this is a more stable life, it's a better life. And it's, it's not, it doesn't compete as well on campus, but it competes when you're 45, right? <laughs> when you're 55. Wait till you see these people when they're 55. Come on, there's a certain time where you, this stuff is not, it's not even befitting anymore. That party lifestyle at the age of 40, at 35 even, right? 40, 50, you're like, it's something else too. Like you're, you, it doesn't suit, sit right. Then you still got like 25 years to live. You want to live with people around you. Now, by the way, human beings, we don't need many, many things. You only need a couple people that love you and you need them at different age levels. You need kids to, that love you because those kids will be life for you later on. Those kids will save you from depression. Those kids will save you from uh, the depression of old age when they produce kids and you, they need you, right? And many people see like, Grandparents who are needed, are fresh, their minds are sharp, they're happy in life. They feel they're contributing something. I only need one or two kids in order to get grandkids, right? I don't need to conquer the world for this, right? <laughs> I need to make sure two, three kids still like me at the end of life, right? So they can trust me with their kids. Allah has made it so easy for us. There was a question here, yeah. What do you do when you're the only Muslim in the workplace and That issue in specific is an issue which the, the, the reframing of it is if the society asks you to recognize a delusion, a non-fact, at what point are we allowed to observe that? And on this issue, it's a delusion. We consider it a delusion. Delusion is something contrary to the truth. The truth is the observed reality in front of us. And in Islam, we don't separate between gender and sex. Gender and sex are the same thing, are one and the same. Who said it? they're different? You have to prove that they're different, right? Gender is a mental construct. Where is it? I can't see it, right? <laughs> so I see sex, right? So that's what it is. So that's the tasawwur, or the perception of the issue. For me to call someone a she because they, be, uh, they want to be called a she, when do we actually do that in the sharia? This is not say it's halal, but... The moment a woman has altered herself, that at first glance you see them and it's a man, and only through examination, arm length or something, that you realize it's that's a man, right? Not a woman. But if they have altered themselves completely, then the Sharia itself says, now you treat them as a woman, right? If a man has altered himself completely to look like a woman, 
we say it's, it's a major sin what they did. But they did it, right? Now you, they're treated as a woman. They were to wear hijab, go to the masjid. Uh, if they go with the women's side, right, you will treat them as a woman. Now, if it's totally a guy, yet he's saying he's a woman, that's delusion. It's also a different form of delusion. But it doesn't necessarily, that is not going to be something that I don't believe you will be required to leave your job or your wealth will be haram. If you're forced to accept that delusion, you force it, uh, you're, you're forced to it, to do it, and you say, astaghfirullah. There's something worse than this, by the way. Taxes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't not our taxes all go to, 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 to kill innocent people and to steal their wealth? So what is our intention when we pay taxes? We make the intention that it's forced. Nobody pays taxes like Chris Rock said, the government takes it, right? It's, they're taking the taxes. I'm forced, I have no choice. I'm born into this theft. Okay, taxation is theft for us. There's only two reasons why a Muslim ruler may ever take your money. It is when there's crime and he, he, he brings a, a, a stabilizing force in the country and when there's an opposing enemy and he has to uh, make a milita- uh, form a military. Then he may say, everyone, you have to pay this much money. That's the only time. Or local taxes to pave roads, etc. But he has to itemize everything. And has to be equally divided by everyone who lives in the town. He has to itemize it. So I treat it like that. I'm forced. What can I do? I'm not, it's not something that the Sharia will require me to quit my job for. So the guy wants to be referred to as a she. In the medical field, all the, the people are facing these different types of things in that field. So may Allah, Allah must die. When you talked about the community thing, mm-hmm. so how do you get your community like that? Community? Like, uh, how do you get it like, to be that strong? The community is strong when they share the same aqidah, the same beliefs, right? Because the beliefs is going to be the beginning of where we're going. So if we all have the same navigation system set up, right, and all of our navigation systems work, we'll arrive at the same destination. Beyond that, it's gatherings. Gatherings with mixed ages. And the best gathering is over food. The Prophet ﷺ established the walima is not just the wedding party, but it's any, ma'duba it's called, any gathering over food. Right? Uh, even one Sahabi said to invite my companions for, for dinner is better to me than spend the whole day in the masjid. Right? They'll go get the animals, slaughter many animals, cook all the animals, and then bring all the Sahaba to eat together. Right? All his co- friends to eat together is better. That's been all day in worship in the masjid because norms are known. People's hearts are cured by friendship, just by being together, feeling like you're part of something bigger. It cures a lot of mental cobwebs are just hosed away. So the same aqidah and then gathering together. And aqidah doesn't have to be the specifics. In general, we're, this is our beliefs. We share these beliefs. So, do you have any uh, book recommendations? What are you currently reading that you would like? Uh, book recommendations. I'm currently reading, Rai, what's the name of the book? The Aqidah book that... Uh, Which one? The Zaytuna published one? Oh, Al-Bidai Fi Usul al-Din. Al-Bidai Fi Usul al-Din. Yeah. Introduction to Islamic Theology. Introduction to Islamic Theology, uh, pr- uh, printed or uh, published by Zaytuna. Uh, it's a big book, so... But uh, to me, Aqidah and Usul al-Fiqh, these are the navigation. That's the navigation of the of, if we're on navigation is going in the same direction, we're good to go. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, the thing you said earlier, uh, Salam, by the way, um, about Ibn Sina. What, what was this, what's the source for that? Uh, of his aqidah or his sex addiction? <laughs> That's what you want, right? <laughs> uh, his own student is the source of the sex addiction, right? If you read his. He's the Jurjani, right? Al, uh, I believe his name is Al Jurjani. I might be pronouncing it wrong. It may be different, but he is the one who admitted that Ibn Sina himself admitted it, and a student wrote it down, right? That he he has diagnosed himself, and then here's the funny thing. He said, despite me knowing that this is my problem, I can't stop. He died upon it. And is that in the same camp as the people who hold it? Beliefs that, that, that narrate what, what beliefs. His beliefs are worse. You can die upon a thousand sins 
and still be forgiven if Allah chooses to forgive you, right? But his aqidah, oh, it's out of this world. Yeah, this is indeed. This is indeed. Yeah, isn't we were talking about differences of opinion before? There's there's differences of opinion. Di difference of opinion on what? On his aqidah and everything. Oh, if you're saying there's transmission that he's a Zindiq and transmission he's not a Zindiq? Well, it's like black and white. Like some will say he's uh, Ismaili, you know. Well, it's. Haramita, I didn't. I didn't he's a Hanafi. Hanafi? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Okay, I mean, the historians within Islam, Islamic history, can really find out what the truth is, but. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about the Aqidah, though. Ibn Taymiyyah will say that he was an uh, extreme Shia, but then other scholars will say it's not true. So, so what was Ghazali going on? Ghazali was citing him, right? So we have to go to the sourcing of Ghazali. What was Ghazali citing? Clearly, Ghazali can't miscite him, right? He has to cite, he cited him in his Tahafas, right? So we have to see what was Ghazali citing. Look, if Ibn Sina turned out to be a good fit, that's benefit for us. Like, he's a saying, though, big I, name. I feel like shooting him down is not in our benefit. Unless it's true. No, this is the first time I'm hearing that. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, that's the first time I'm hearing it. So you, if you're right, I hope you're right. We, we, do we want people to be Zindiqs in hell? <laughs> right? We, that's, not in our, that's not something we want, right? Uh, but my perception was what Gazette is. <laughs> He doesn't believe in the uh, bodily resurrection, right? Things like that. Right. Yeah. So if it's if that if Kazadi was wrong, he's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. so. um, thank you all very much for your attention and for giving us the opportunity to come visit your community. Jazakumullah khairan, and you are all welcome to visit our community at MBIC, mbic.org. We're not so far. I know. Uh, Usually New Yorkers don't come out much, but uh, we're only literally 40 minutes away, and we have programming uh, every Friday night at our masjid. So you're welcome to come and check it out at mbic.org. You get the um, you can find out what programs are running. Uh, the, we only take off uh, once a month, which is if there's a fifth Friday of the month, we don't run a program. But the first four Fridays of every month, there's always something at the masjid, whether it's a dhikr or a community talk and a dinner. And a special event. So just that come off here. The podcast. Uh, am I, are we allowed to, stream, uh, to, to advertise here? Sure. Oh, we run a podcast. Alhamdulillah. Uh, every day at one uh, at one o'clock, we run a podcast uh, at on the YouTube channel of Safina Society. So go to YouTube Safina Society. We run a live stream. There are people could ask questions and talk, and we have different interviews, and it's a good time. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا الحق وتواصلوا الصبر والسلام